Today on Eric Builds, we will be covering feedback from Green Building Advisor on some post-frame house details, such as an air barrier, rain screen, how to prevent pest intrusion, a double wall and its performance simulation, and roof condensation and how it will be managed. We're going to talk about some new design details that I have been working on, such as a simpler layout, a plywood slab, and mini splits. We will also go into a whole house energy simulation. We'll look at some renders of rooms. And lastly, a cost update. Let's get started. But first, there's one thing. Let's transform. Green Building Eric. Shazam! Oh. Oh. Green Building Eric here. Let's get to Martin Holiday's feedback. Martin Holiday, Eric, there are several problems with walls that lack sheathing, including one, where is the air barrier? Two, how do you detail a rain screen that prevents water entry? And three, how do you keep rodents and insects out of the wall? Let's jump right into where is the air barrier? So here's a section of the house. On top, I've drawn in the air barrier in the walls. It is in the double wall, between the double walls. On the ceiling, it is above the drywall. And then in the ground, it is between the solid insulation. How do you detail a rain screen that prevents water entry? Same section view. So the roof steel is the top, and then there is Tyvek Commercial D behind the wall steel. There's PVC insulation protection on the rigid insulation below ground, and then that leads into EPDM membrane. And then let's go into some details of the custom rain screen. For standard buildings, there's an option to use core event, sturdy batten. And for this build, I'd like to do something similar. I plan to use polypropylene sheet, six millimeter uh, corrugated. And that is gonna go behind the walls as so, providing a constant six millimeter gap, at, which will function as a rain screen. You know, there's one interesting detail is that you're gonna be, to do this, you space the screws out by extra six millimeter. I looked at the loading on those screws, starting with the tear out resistance of the steel, using that as a load, and then applying that load to the screw and bending in FEA. And you can see that the actual stress levels are still only around 2,000 PSI, which is not bad at all. How do you keep rodents and insects out of the wall assembly? Here is another section where we're going to look at all the different things that shield the wall from rodents and insects. First thing is the concrete block. Next is the three quarter inch rock that the concrete block is holding. And then there is EPDM membrane on the lower insulation, PVC sheet on the upper insulation, and then getting up into the steel of the, the wall assembly, there is a J channel, and then the ends of the steel have a foam closure strip, as you see here, which is sitting on top of that six meter corrugated plastic. That should be pretty effective at keeping stuff out. Uh, here is uh, details from that article from Martin Holiday. He goes into the various elements of a wall and a pole bar. He says a typical well-constructed residential wall from the outside in consists of siding, a ventilated rain screen gap, a water resistive barrier, a relatively airtight layer of sheathing, insulation between the studs, and a relatively airtight layer of drywall. So. That's not exactly what you will have in a post frame building. So let's go into why we're planning something slightly different for the wall. So here I'm using a Ubicus tool. This is a German online wall simulator tool. Let's go for the elements of the wall starting outside to in. So there's the steel and then there is that six millimeter constant gap. And I have found a way to actually simulate the air inside of the channels of the steel as well. And then we get to the Tyvek Pro, um, and then there is Rockwell, um, two by eight studs, which would actually be rotated 90 degrees, uh, the Intello on the outside of those, an air gap, and then a standard uh, two foot spacing stud wall that also has Rockwell. Lastly, on top of the drywall, there is vapor resistant paint. So you can see this ends up at a pretty nice R value, R37 in freedom units. And let's get into the moisture protective elements of the wall. So this is looking at it with no rain screen. You can see there would be condensation on the flat parts of the corrugated steel. Uh, that's not good. That's why there's a rain screen with that constant gap of six millimeters. You know, there is none of that problem with the condensation. 
you can bring that gap down to even two millimeters and it will still function. So there's some room for variation in the size of the rain screen. This is going into more details of the article from Martin on the ceiling and roofs. So one unique element of post rain is again, the lack of sheathing. So you have to deal with condensation on the steel in a different way. One thing that the post frame industry has done is come up with a nylon fleece that it comes pre-applied to the ceilings or the roof steel. So that's a good option. I'm planning to do that. What happens is as the condensation forms, it is just held there on that fleece and then over time it will harmlessly evaporate. And that's a lot better than having drips or anything in your attic. So let's go back into the floor wall insulation or intersection. It's another critical area. Um, I'm just going to jump right into the picture here. And one side note here is the concrete free slab. So this is another thing that I'm planning for this build is to not have a concrete slab, but to use two layers of plywood subfloor instead. This is something that others on Green Building Advisor have done. And there's a few pros to it. Uh, it's kind of outside the scope of this video, so we're going to move on. So you can see, as we were talking about, there's the gasket between the plywood slab and the interior stud walls. And then the tops of the interior stud walls are actually floating. So that's to accommodate both variations in the subgrade, if there are any. And then the attic trusses are going to move up and down as they dry out during the winter. So that accommodates that. And then another detail here is the concrete piers. Uh, before I was looking at using precast concrete beams, but now I moved on to this approach of using the square forms with insulation to form the piers. So what this would have is a step to it to allow for insulation, and then that step would have that little square at the top that's about eight by eight inches square, and that's where the wet set brackets would be placed. Jumping into mini splits, another big design change has from been from geothermal to mini splits. So there's a lot of different elements to the modern mini splits that let them work at extremely cold temperatures. This unit from Mitsubishi can work all the way down to make the 13 Fahrenheit. Below that, the plan is to use these baseboard strip heaters uh, for backup. One great feature of this Mitsubishi unit is its turndown ratio. The turndown ratio is how much can it turn down before it has to turn off. You don't want it to turn off, you want it to just turn down because it will stay running constantly and it will be more efficient. This one's ratio is 6. Uh, I did a performance simulation of the whole house in Beop software. So on Beop software you can specify first the outside of the house, its shape, and then you get into a detailed list of house parameters and you specify all those. And you end up with this, which is a chart of temperatures and other performance details of your house. There's too many outputs to mention here in this video, but you can see here, this is an average day of every month looking at red, the heating demand, and then blue, the cooling demand, and then orange is the input heat from the solar glazing. So that's the heat that comes in through the windows that you get for free. So do this tool, I've specified high solar heat coefficient windows, and that means that the, for those south facing windows are gonna have special glass in them, that lets in more solar heat gain. And then here we're looking at uh, how much heat is the heat pump water heater pulling out of the air. So that's another change is to use a heat pump water heater and I have it ducted so it pulls from the largest room in the house. Mini split versus geothermal. I had originally planned to use geothermal and I had the misconception that it was more efficient but what I found running this BIOP software sim was that the best and most modern of mini splits can approach the performance or even better the performance of some of yesterday's best geothermal. Net zero solar. So I'm planning to eventually add a ground mount solar array and using BIOP I found that I would need roughly 7 kilowatts to hit net zero. Let's jump into some renders. Turn down for what? And the cost. How much will it cost? So I added everything up just like before. Got a total of 210, which is only slightly less. I believe a lot of that is just because costs have continued to climb even since August of last year. Thanks for watching. This is Eric Builds. Wish me luck.